going to talk about the assessment of pain and symptoms in children. And our objectives are to understand some features of communication with children, which will allow you to do your symptom assessment, understand some useful pain skills, which can be used as well as symptom assessment tools and scales. And the first piece to assessing pain is communication, particularly with children. Children won't tell you what's going on with them if they don't trust you. So you really have to build a bit of rapport with children. And some of the things you can do, make eye contact with the patient. Remember that the patient is actually the child and not the parents and family. Introduce who you are, what you do, speak to the child, make sure you're speaking to the child because they're the patient. And of course I speak to the parents as well, but I start with the child. Use language that the patient and the family understands. So remember that the younger the child is, the simpler the language you're going to have to use. And you're also going to have to, you might have to figure out, ask the parents what words they use for pain. So in Canada, in English, sometimes kids will use ouchie for pain or boo-boo for pain instead of the word pain. So you might need to ask the parents what words they use. And a, another way to build rapport with kids is to get down on their level. So if you're standing up and they're sitting on the ground playing, it's very intimidating for kids. So you have to get down to where they are. That way you're less scary and always explain how you can help. Because sometimes people, if they don't think you can do anything to help them, then they might not open up and tell you what's going on. Learn about the child, because that will help you in your assessment later on. So what does the child like? What do they do? Do they go to school? Do they have activities, favorite toys? Try to find common ground for one thing, but also you can, if you know what they normally like to do compared to what they're doing now, that gives you clues to whether they have pain or not. So is pain even an issue in palliative care? Well, it's very common and more than 70% of patients with advanced cancer will have pain. Some people think that children don't feel pain but they feel pain actually the same way as adults. And this is throughout all life stages. So all the way from premature babies into adulthood, they can feel and actually remember pain. So what's the definition of pain? Well, pain is any unpleasant physical or emotional experience associated with tissue damage or described by the patient in those terms, such as burning or stabbing pain. And remember that just because you can't say that you have pain, it doesn't mean that you don't have pain. And finally, remember that pain is subjective. So my pain is different from your pain, but that doesn't mean that we don't have pain. Again, remember that pain is multidimensional. So there's physiological factors, emotional factors, sociocultural factors based on your background, family dynamics, behavioral factors, how you communicate, other symptoms that are associated with it, cognitive factors, particularly the meaning of pain. If I, for example, if I have cancer and my pain is getting worse, is that because my cancer is getting worse? And then a sensory component as well, when you talk about the pain severity, where it is, the quality of the pain. So how do you assess pain? Well, the first thing is you ask about it. You ask about pain every day, ask the patient and ask the family. That's your number one. And the gold standard for assessing a child's pain is asking the child if they have pain. Ask about activities and the child's mood. So sometimes people will say, no, they don't have any pain. 
but they might tell you that normally this child is very happy and smiling, laughs all day, likes to color, play with her toys all day long, but now she's moody, sullen, crying, doesn't want to play with her toys, doesn't want to color, and that gives you a clue that maybe actually this patient does have pain. And remember that children who have pain for a long time, they don't always show signs the same way that someone who's in acute pain might show. They may just be quiet and still. They may look sad. They may not cry because they've had the pain for a long time. And they just may not participate in activities the way they usually do. And as I mentioned, the gold standard is to ask the child. And you always have to believe a child who says that they have pain. Don't ignore the pain and don't assume that a child is exaggerating or lying about their pain. And actually, a lot of the time, children will minimize their pain. And some of the reasons they do that is because they know that it upsets their parents when they say they have pain and they don't want to upset their parents. They also, maybe they associate, if they tell you they have pain, maybe they know that that means they're going to get a needle, for example. So they'll tell you, oh, I don't have any pain. So for the most part, children don't exaggerate or lie about their pain. So when you're assessing pain, what are some questions that you need to ask? So one way to remember, if you can't remember all the things, is to remember P-Q-R-S-T-U. And so P stands for palliation or provocation. So what makes your pain better? What makes your pain worse? The quality of your pain. What does it feel like? Is it sharp, burning, stabbing, dull? The region and the radiation. So where is it? Where does it start? And where does it radiate to? The timing, when did it start? How long did it, does it last? Is it always there or does it come and go? And then you is how is it affecting you and your activities? And remember, depending on the age of the child, they won't necessarily be able to answer all of these questions, particularly the quality of pain. A lot of times that's that can be tough even for adults. So for kids, that one is sometimes harder. As well as, you know, where's your pain and does it radiate? So some kids, younger kids, they might always tell you that they have tummy pain. Even if they have pain in their arm or pain in their leg or pain in their head, it's just always tummy pain. And that is developmentally as kids get older, then they're able to tell you actually where the pain is. But when they're very young, they might, like when they're a toddler, they might just tell you that they have tummy pain, even if that's not where their pain is. So what are some pain scales that we can use in children? So the most frequently used ones, the ones that I use most often, one of them is called FLAC. And that one is an observation scale. We use faces a lot, which is a self-reported scale, as well as the numeric scale, same as you would in adults, which is again, self-reported. And these are what those look like, and we're gonna go into a bit more detail. So the FLAC scale, this is for kids zero to 18, and there's face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability. So you watch the child and then you give them a score based on these criteria. And so remember, difficult to console or comfort can indicate pain more so than a child who's content and relaxed. And it works for zero to 18 years. You have to watch the child for a few minutes Make sure their legs and arms are uncovered so that you can see what they look like. And when you score it, if it's zero, there's no pain, the child's comfortable. If they get one to three, that would be considered mild pain. Four to six is moderate and seven to 10 is severe. 
This is what a FACES pain scale looks like. And you can generally use this with children who are over three, if they're neurodevelopmentally normal. And you have to explain it to them. You have to, and you have to use the, a language that they'll understand. But basically you say, these faces show how much something can hurt. This face shows no pain. This face shows more and more pain. Up to this one, it shows very much pain. And you, you point to the different faces. And then you ask the child to point to the face that shows how much you hurt right now. Now remember, this is a self-report scale. Sometimes people get confused about the scale and they think that you look at the child and match their face to the face and that's how you do it, but that's wrong. You have to ask the child where they put themselves because a child can be smiling and still have pain. And again, if they're pointing to eight to 10, that would be severe pain versus a moderate pain or a mild pain. The numerical rating scale generally is good for kids who are eight years or over. And again, you have to set it up for them and you say zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain you can imagine. How much is your pain right now? And you get them to tell you a number, point to a number. So one thing to remember, even though you can use a numerical rating scale for kids who are eight years or older, kids tend to prefer the faces scale. So if you have a choice, if you have a child who's eight years old and you have a choice, often they will prefer to do the faces scale versus the numerical scale. So just because you can use it when someone's eight, it doesn't mean that you can't use the faces scale at that time as well. And every child is different. So you may actually have a seven-year-old who's able to do the numerical scale, and you might have a 10-year-old who still wants to use the faces scale. The other thing is you can, if, if all of those are, are not working and the child isn't really understanding how to use the scales, sometimes I just say, is your pain a little pain? Is it a medium or a middle pain? Or is it a really big pain? And so when you break it down like that to something really simple, often kids are able to tell you a little bit whether it's a small pain or a big pain. And remember that the numerical rating scales, if you're going to use them, you have to use them regularly because really you can't say that my eight is the same as someone else's eight. But for this child, if they're telling you every day their pain is an eight and then you start them on some medication and now they're telling you your pain is six, that's how you know that your medication is starting to work. So what are some other symptoms that are associated with pain or not associated with pain? Because people can have pain, but they can also have other symptoms. So you want to make sure you're asking about nausea, vomiting, and again, use language that the child's going to understand. So I wouldn't ask a small child if they were nauseous, but I might ask them, do you feel like you need to throw up? Dyspnea. So again, language, how does your breathing feel? Does it feel hard to breathe? If they're tired, fatigued, what's their energy like? You need to find out about sleep, how they're sleeping, appetite, if they have any constipation or diarrhea. Another important thing is sadness, to ask them or the family if they're having any sadness, worry, itchiness and all those things are things that need to be assessed. So the there's not as many scales of course for things other than pain but one of the scales that you can use in pediatrics is called the memorial symptom assessment scale 
and it's modified for pediatrics. If anyone has ever used the adult one, there is a little bit modified version for pediatrics. And so basically it goes through these questions. Did you feel more tired yesterday or today than you usually do? Did you feel sad? Were you itchy? And it goes through the questions. And I did um, send along an article that has the full scale, but basically you have to explain it to patients and, and they need to be able to read it and understand it in order to fill it out. But for example, it says, did you have any pain yesterday or today? And then they say yes or no. And if they said yes, you, it then asks them, how much of the time did you have pain? Very short time, a medium amount, or almost all of the time. How much pain did you feel? A little, a medium amount, or a lot? And how much did the pain bother you or trouble you? It didn't do it at all, or it did it a little, it did it a medium amount, it did very much. And so this just goes through all those symptoms and it's for the patient to fill out on their own. It's important to remember that these scales, other than the observation scale, the flak one, all these scales are for the kids to fill out, not for the parents to tell you, oh, his pain is eight. Unless, of course, the child told the parent and the parent's just telling you, but it's really, it's, it's the child's voice, not the family's voice. And even if you're not using the scales, because I don't, I don't know if where you are, if the patients would be able to do that, if they speak enough English to use the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale, or if there's, because I, I haven't seen one um, in really very many other languages. But when you're talking to the child, ask about the symptoms other than pain, and ask what has been bothering the child, because sometimes, they might tell you that they have pain and they're, they don't have a good appetite, but then when you ask them what's bothering them, they might tell you, oh, it's that I don't have enough energy to go play soccer with my friends. And you also wanna ask what's been bothering the parents because sometimes the symptom that's bothering the child is different from the symptom that's bothering the parents. For example, a lot of the time, parents are really concerned when a child has lost their appetite or has a decreased appetite, whereas often the child, they don't care about that. So you want to kind of know what the child thinks as well as what the family thinks. And so... That's really my overview of how to assess pain and symptoms in children. And the most important takeaway is to, it really takes good communication. You have to talk to the child and kind of get them to a place where they trust you and they're willing to talk to you about their symptoms. And that starts when kids are very young. So you don't, we do that even when kids are, two or three, you start to talk to them. And they're not going to, of course, tell you as much as a teenager, but you have to remember that the child is the patient and you need to be able to connect with them in order for them to tell you the truth about what they're feeling. 